Hello and welcome everyone back to the science class. So today we're going to be continuing our talk about thermochemistry. So you remember in the previous video, we were using MC delta T when talking about temperature changes in thermochemistry. However, there's another component. Q is different for phase changes than it is just for temperature changes. And with that, we're also gonna be learning how to interpret heating and cooling curves. So if you look at our goal for this video, we're gonna be able to use HF and HV to calculate heat of phase changes. And we're also gonna be able to interpret the heating and cooling curves. So in the New York State Regents reference tables for chemistry, table B shows us our heat of fusion at 334 joules per gram and our heat of vaporization at 2260 joules per gram. Now you might remember specific heat capacity of water because that was our C and MC delta T. Now on table T of the reference tables, we can see the different equations we'll be using throughout thermochem. So before, this is the equation that we're talking about, Q equals MC delta T. However, we also need to look at Q equals MHF and Q equals MHV. So if we take a look on the side, in case we don't remember some of these variables, they're all labeled for us on the reference tables. Question is, what the heck is heat of fusion? And what's heat of vaporization? Well, simply put, heat of fusion is for the melting or freezing. Heat of vaporization, as you may have guessed, turning things into vapor, or it could be condensing. So it goes both ways. You're either letting go of energy, releasing energy, therefore you'd be melting, or you'd be condensing, or you're absorbing energy. And if you're absorbing energy, well, you could be melting, and you're gonna be vaporizing. Now let's take a look further. All right, state what happens to the average kinetic energy of the molecules in the sample during the first three minutes. Okay, now if we learned before or remembered before, we should know my pet peeve is mixing up temperature and heat. Not the same thing. Temperature is the change in kinetic energy. If there's a change in temperature or simply put, we can just call it the average kinetic energy. Heat on the other hand, is simply the transfer of energy. So well, the question asks, what happens to the average kinetic energy of the molecules between minute zero and minute three? Well, we're just taking a look at temperature. Now this is a cooling curve. Now we know this obviously because it's labeled on top. However, temperature is decreasing over time. So we know this has to be a cooling curve, not a heating curve. Now, if we take a look at minutes zero to three, we see that the temperature is decreasing over time. So to answer this question, it's very simple. There's a decrease in average kinetic energy. Or we can just simply say decrease. We don't have to be super detailed for these type of questions. All right, let's take a look at a problem that requires some math. Heat is added to a 200 gram sample of H2O. Now don't forget, S, L, G all refer to the phases. So this refers to solid water, also known as ice. So let's read that again. Heat is added to a 200 gram sample of ice to melt the sample at zero degrees Celsius. So it's at the freezing point. Then the resulting liquid water is heated to a final temperature of 65 degrees Celsius. In the space below, show a numerical setup for calculating the total amount of heat required to raise the temperature of liquid water from zero degrees Celsius to its final temperature. Okay, so we know there's gonna be a phase change here because we're melting the sample. So therefore we have to either use Q equals MHF or Q equals MHV. Okay, now we're melting. So therefore we have to use heat of fusion. So Q is equal to 200 grams 
And for your convenience, HF is equal to 334 joules per gram. All right, to make our lives much easier, we're just going to use a calculator, 200 times 334. I'm going to get Q is equal to 66,800 joules. For our convenience, let's just calculate this in kilojoules to make the number a little more manageable. Okay, now we know the heat of the phase change. However, we know the water melts at zero degrees Celsius, but now we have to increase the temperature to 65 degrees Celsius. So this is where our previous video comes into play and we're using MC delta T. Okay, so Q is equal to same mass, 200 grams. Our specific heat capacity of water is 4.18. And our delta T, final temperature, minus the initial temperature. Okay, so now we just have to multiply across. So 200 times 4.18 times 65. Now we get Q is equal to 54,340. And again, to make things more manageable, let's just convert this to kilojoules. Well, now we want to know the total heat, so we're going to have to add these values together. Okay, and again, using the calculator, 66.8 kilojoules plus 54.3 kilojoules is going to equal a total Q of 121.1 .1 kilojoules. Now, again, these are practice regions questions. So these have been on a regions exam at one point or another. So you may be asked something like this. Now, to get you to understand the material a little better, I solved the math for these problems. But generally speaking, if it asks for a numerical setup, you're just giving a numerical setup. I do not recommend doing the math through because there's a lot of room for error. So again, I did this so that you can better understand how to use these equations especially for those multiple choice questions. However, in the future, if you see on the Regents exam, show a numerical setup, don't do the math fully. Just asking for trouble. All right, so let's take a look at another problem. Starting as a solid at negative 25 degrees Celsius, a sample of water is heated at a constant rate until the sample is at 125 degrees Celsius. This heating occurs at standard pressure the graph below represents the relationship between temperature and heat added to the sample. Okay, so we know this is a heating curve because our title tells us. However, we also know it's a heating curve because temperature is increasing over time. Now, of course, you may say, be saying to yourself, hey, temperature change, so I'm going to use MC delta T. However, we always have to read our axis labels. So if you look, on the x-axis is not time, it's actually heat added. So therefore, all we have to do is just measure the heat difference between the intervals C and D. Now, just looking at the x-axis, a little bit of weird intervals, but we know that there's an increase of four per line. So if we look down C, down D, we can just estimate that this is seven, and this is 17. On the regions exam, there's going to be a range for the proper answer. Well, let's just call this 7 and 17. Well, total amount of heat added to the sample, final minus initial, 17 kilojoules minus 7 kilojoules. And that's going to equal 10 kilojoules. That's our answer, 10 kilojoules. That's why it's super important to read our problems, read the axes, read the labels, look at our graph, because we could have overcomplicated this question a lot by trying to use MC delta T, but instead we could have just read the graph. Okay, another problem. Base your answer to the following question on the graph below, which represents the cooling of a substance starting at a temperature above its boiling point. This time, it's not labeled heating or cooling curve. Can you guess which one it is? 
Well, temperature is decreasing over time. So temperature is decreasing. And we have a cooling curve. Now, the question is, which segment of the graph represents the gas phase only? So we haven't talked yet about how to interpret a heating curve or a cooling curve. If we notice there's a change in temperature, and then all of a sudden temperature does not change. But over time, we know in a cooling curve that Q or heat is being lost to the surroundings from the system. Well, if heat is decreasing consistently over time, then why does temperature not change with it? Don't forget, temperature does not equal heat. And phase changes are an example of why we can't confuse these two. So if you remember, there's heat of fusion and heat of vaporization. One is for melting and freezing. And then one is for vaporizing or condensing. All right, if I'm losing Q, if I'm losing heat, condensing, or freezing. If I'm melting or vaporizing, I'm increasing my Q. Okay, so we started above the boiling point. So from here to here, that's our HV. From here to here is our HF. This is why HF and HV are different numbers. 334, 2260, because there's a lot of energy involved in vaporizing and condensing, and there's a decent amount of energy involved in melting or freezing. This is different from temperature changes, which use specific heat capacity, which is just 4.18, a lot smaller than 2260 or 334. So on a heating or cooling curve, if we see flat lines, this is either these indicate phase changes. Now, how do I know this is HV? How do I know this is HF? Well, there's a lower temperature at the HF and a higher temperature at the HV. Now the question is asking which segment of the graph represents the gas phase only? Well, here is a phase change. So the only part of the graph that just has a gas is whatever is above HV. So this is going to be from A to B. So A to B. Now, if the question was asking, just in the liquid phase, well, that's in between vaporizing and freezing. And if it asked just in the solid phase, well, this is past the freezing point. And again, these are changes in temperature right over here that are slanted, and then these are phase changes where the temperature does not increase or decrease. All right, let's take a look at another problem. Temperature of a sample of a substance increased from 20 degrees Celsius to 160 degrees Celsius. As the sample absorbs heat at a constant rate of 50 kilojoules per minute at a standard pressure. The graph below represents the relationship between temperature and time as the sample is heated. Okay, now our title says temperature versus time. But because temperature is increasing over time, we can call this a heating curve. Now, let's remember, what do these flat lines represent? These are phase changes because the temperature is not increasing or decreasing. The lower temperature one is our HF. The higher temperature one is our heat of vaporization. Question is, total amount of energy required to completely melt the sample at its melting point. Well, we know the melting point is right here, because this is where melting and freezing happens. And we know it's right here because it's lower than the HV, it's lower than the other flat line. And we know the flat lines represent the boiling point and the freezing point. Determine the total amount of heat, well, automatically you can say, okay, well... If I'm calculating a phase change, we can use Q equals MHF. However, if you look at the graph, we know melting happens between minute two and minute four. Therefore, this happens over two minutes. What does the question say? Heat is absorbed at a constant rate of 15 kilojoules per minute. Don't complicate things. Two 
times 15 kg, sorry, kj. Well, now the total amount of heat from this graph we know is 30 kilojoules. That's why it's important, again, read your axes, read your prompt, read your question. If you wanna pass any assessment, especially the regions exam, you need to learn how to read everything. Take a look at another problem. Starting as a gas at 206 degrees Celsius, a sample of a substance is allowed to cool for 16 minutes. This process is represented by a cooling curve below. Again, we know this is a cooling curve because temperature is decreasing over time. The question asks, at what time do the particles of the sample have the lowest average kinetic energy? Do you remember what another word is for average kinetic energy? Temperature. Temperature does not equal heat. So what this is asking for is what is the lowest temperature indicated on this curve? Well, luckily this dotted line drawn for us. That's this point right over here. Now we take a look over here. 40, 60, the point in between must be 50. So 50 degrees is our lowest point, but it's asking for time. So our time is 16 minutes. What is the melting point of this substance? What do the flat lines represent? These are phase changes. Now, which one's going to be the melting point? The higher temp one or the lower temp one? If you said higher, try again. If you said lower, you are correct. So between 180, that would be 90. So the melting point of the substance in degrees Celsius is 90 degrees Celsius. All right, so hopefully you're able to benefit from those practice problems. And stay tuned for another time. Then we can start talking about other aspects of thermochemistry.